Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. Good afternoon. Um, I want to go ahead and start with a story. Uh, it's a personal story that probably a lot of you guys can relate to. So I started the business in 2005 named Gardekid. Um, this was a child safety and children's identification business. Uh, so what we did is we went to schools and we provided parents with an opportunity to have an identification of their child on hand in case their child went missing. And we produced a set of digital and printed IDs um, for parents so that in case their child went missing, they had an easy way to transmit that child's information to the authorities. So that business grew very, very fast. Naturally, this is something that every parent needs. So um, we started doing this in daycares, in elementary schools, in uh, middle schools throughout the Miami region. Um, so when I started this business, like most of you that are in here that are business owners, I had this grand idea of turning this business into a very large business that basically uh, can expand not only nationwide but worldwide. So when I started the business, I had two motivations behind it. Number one, I had my own young children at the time. This is 2005. They're no longer young anymore. Well, they're young, but they're not kids anymore. But uh, so the product I could relate to, it's something that I needed for my own kids. And as they say, the invention, most of the inventions are as a result of a need that's out there. So the number two reason that I started this business, which is something that is probably more in common with all of you guys in here, is that I wanted this business to be something huge, the, good, the great American dream. I wanted it to be a product that is served everywhere throughout the nation and hopefully worldwide. So as this business grew throughout uh, the Miami region, I quickly started thinking about the next location. Let me start one in Fort Lauderdale and hopefully in Palm Beach County next and Orlando and on and on and on. So obviously to do that, the option that was in front of me was to hire someone that can run that Fort Lauderdale or the Palm Beach operation. So that's when the dream of becoming this big company just crumbled right in front of me because I realized that I can't give my business to someone, to someone else that's going to run it that doesn't have a vested interest in this business. I have spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources building this company and building this brand. And the last thing that I ever wanted was to see someone who's just an employee grab a hold of this business, starts working, and it starts doing things wrong, start getting bad Yelp reviews or bad whatever online reviews, which is going to affect my brand overall. So, in fact, I was so cautious about that, that my own business here in Miami was operated by myself. I was the one that was actually going out there and doing this business uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, mind you, I come from the corporate world prior to this. I was an executive at Motorola for several years. And I left that business because, again, I wanted to have that great American dream, right? So I wanted to have my own business and be able to be in, be in control of my own destiny. So, so here I am out there in schools doing this child ID services and so forth and so on. And as the business grew, I, 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 I asked my wife to help me out. And she's, poor thing, she was out there helping me out every day because, again, I could trust her. I knew that she wasn't going to destroy my product, my brand. And then, of course, as the business grew, I started utilizing my friends. So then I realized, okay, well, I can't go on. I can't have this to become a nationwide company utilizing the network that's right around me. And I, I noticed that, you know, having someone that doesn't have a vested interest in the business is a problem when they're running your, 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 your business. Also, what happened if they mistreated one of the kids? Now we have a serious problem on our hand, so I have liabilities that I have to worry about, so I couldn't go to sleep comfortable at night. That's when I started getting involved in the world of franchising, and I realized that franchising answered all of those questions. Every single one of those questions got answered with franchising. So I'm gonna talk about that in a second. I'm gonna tell you exactly how franchising works, but needless to say, as a franchise, I was able to get people that bought into my idea and paid me money and started this business at their own location. They got the training from me 
And I was able to sleep comfortable at night when I had a franchise in Nigeria, when I had a franchise in Taiwan, when I had a franchise in Mexico, when I had a franchise in Los Angeles. And I could sleep comfortable at night knowing that I'm not responsible. I don't have a liability. Someone else does. And I knew that the guy that was running those operations cared about this business just as much as I did because he spent the same money I did to start this business. So because of that, he cared about this business like I did, so he was going to show up on time, he was going to handle these ki kids correctly, and so forth and so on. So franchising answered all of my problems. I was able to grow the company between the years 2005 and 2010 in short five years to 175 locations in 11 countries worldwide. It was ranked among the top 100 fastest growing franchises in years 2008 and 9, where the whole world was crumbling around us, right? So, so that business, by the way, got bought out in 2010, and that's when we started working on helping others franchise their business. So what is a franchise? A franchise is when someone comes to you, if you guys are business owners, and says, look, wow, you got a great pizza here. This joint, this pizza joint will do fantastic in the city that I'm from, or this sub shop will do fantastic or this gym or whatever you own will do very well where we come from that's the beginning those are the seeds of the franchise operation that's being uh, built so a person that comes to you and says I wanna buy a franchise if you were to be a franchise operation pays you a franchise fee up front that fee is anywhere between twenty to fifty thousand dollars typically sometimes higher sometimes lower but with that fee you will give them basically nothing tangible, nothing uh, that costs you anything. So you, you're earning all that money, that twenty to $50,000 that's paid up front, you're earning all that money as profit. The only thing you're giving back to them is basically the training, the know-how, and the permission for them to use your brand to open a location in their territory. They'll go on and they're going to find a location. Are you going to give them some help as to where to look? Are they going to look in a residential area, in a commercial area, in an industrial area, whatever the business calls for? And you're going to get them, you give them that assistance. They're going to start this business and they're going to do the construction. If there is a construction to be done, they're going to do the hiring of employees. They're going to get all the permits and they're going to start this business all on their own dime. So, so far, you just started a brand new location in another city and you haven't spent a dime of your money and you haven't really spent any time either, which is a beautiful thing. You're going to hear me say this throughout this presentation today. Franchising is one of the most beautiful things that one can do because it's all really positive. Um, so, this person hires the employee. So, all those employee headaches that we're all used to hearing uh, we're all dealing with goes away because of the fact that they're dealing with it you're not dealing with it um, they're gonna sign the lease on their own and they're going to start the operation so now they're gonna have to buy inventory from you in order to sell these products so there's another way you make money so the inventory that you sell these franchisees of course the price is higher than where you buy it from so now this is the second method for you to make money you made money up front with, with the franchise fee, now you're making up uh, money on, 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 on inventory you're selling to them. And the third way becomes the royalty that they're gonna pay you. So as they start selling these products or services, they're going to um, pay you royalty, which is usually five to 15% off the top, which is the sales, gross sales that come in. So, <clears throat> so this is the three major ways that a that a that a particular franchise operations makes makes money out of their franchisees. Now these franchisees are required; they're required to um, uh, spend a certain amount of money on a monthly basis on local advertising, and also pay you that trickle, uh, maybe one or two percent out of their out of their sales that you're going to spend on advertising their brand nationally. This is the reason why you see Subway. You see McDonald's, you see Domino's Pizza in the middle of Super Bowl, and those are the guys that have the money, the budget to, uh, to, to spend one or two mil or three or four million dollars on a 30 second ad. Because that money is really coming from the franchisees and it's not really coming from their pockets. So, another co cool thing about franchising is that you have full visibility to the operation of the business. That means on a given day, you're going to log into the POS terminal and you're going to find out exactly on a particular time of the day how much sales they've made, 
um, you can log in and look at the cameras and see, okay, this is, oh, the, the, the restaurant is full or the gym is uh, empty or whatever the case is, and you can make adjustments to that. You can actually uh, call the guy up and say, look, you know, you're slacking off, what's going on? You know, the, the, the restaurant is empty. So you can actually, you have day-to-day -day visibility to, to the business. All right, so let's go back to the scenario that I talked about, my own story, Garda Kid. So I had a situation on my hand. I wanted to grow the business, but I couldn't because I was worried that somebody's going to destroy my brand. Somebody is going to come in and uh, perhaps even steal from me, right? I mean, uh, there's cash business involved, and you know, I didn't know how to control all that money that was coming in and so forth and so on. So, uh, so all of these problems are gone away with the franchise model, as you can see here. Uh, that because of the fact that the franchisee has spent the same money you have spent in starting that location, he cares about this business just like you care about it. More importantly, you have a stick over their head. Why? Because if they ever step out of line and do something that is not desired or it's outside of the, the, the requirements that you've set forth, forth for them, you can take that franchise away from them. So they always have this fear of losing their franchise because of whatever reason it may be. This is, again, one reason why you go to a drive through of Wendy's or McDonald's and it says, how was our service called 1-800-something? It doesn't say call 305-something. It says call 1-800-something because that's the corporate headquarters. They want to hear from you as the client how that franchisee is doing. If that franchisee gets multiple bad reviews or bad remarks, they'll punish the franchisee and eventually can, they can shut him down. They can take that franchise away from them. So you have a full control over these operations. More importantly, guys, no liability for you. So that means I can, in my scenario, I could go to sleep comfortably knowing that a child in Taiwan is being uh, ID'd right now and is being handled by one of my um, guard kid representatives without me being liable. And that was a, that's another beautiful thing about franchising. So you franchise your business to get immediate and rapid expansion, expansion into your brand because you don't have to spend a dime of your money to expand your business. Some of these uh, business owners come to us and I have the pleasure to speak to multiple uh, business owners on a weekly basis and they say, um, listen, I'm about to open my third location or fourth location and my comment to them always is, why? Why don't you franchise your business? You're putting more of your money out there you're putting more of your time out there. You're spending less time at home with your wife or your husband. You're spending less time with your family. You're taking on more liability. Why don't you just franchise your business? Let someone else own it. You sit back, relax, and collect your six, seven, eight percent. Brand recognition. Every time you open a second location or third location by your franchisees, you're not paying money, but guess what? They're advertising your brand for you. As a result of that, you're getting this tremendous brand recognition once again with other people's money. You get an immediate infusion of cash. So they pay you that huge franchise fee up front. So that franchise fee of twenty, thirty, or forty thousand dollars, multiply that by ten or fifteen or twenty of these things that you can sell in a, in a year. You, you, you're putting together a very nice portfolio for yourself. So of course you're getting on on um, share of the revenue as well. So. Another good thing about franchising is that franchisees have a better understanding of the local market. If you have a business, if you have a, a pizza shop here in Miami, and think about opening another second pizza shop in Los Angeles. Well, if I told you, listen, uh, where would you advertise in Miami? You know all the advertising resources here. You know, but if, you, if you were to put a billboard, you know exactly where to put that billboard. But if you ask me in Los Angeles, I have no clue. I have no clue where to advertise. But the guy that lives in Los Angeles, he knows that much better than you. So he has a better understanding of the local market. And, and allows you to maintain control of your business, of your products, and pricing. You know, you guys see sometimes these uh, big franchises, they have new products that they bring in. McRib is a, is a good example of McDonald's where they introduce it in the seasonally and then they take it away. Franchisor is dictating that to each location, telling them now you must sell this product. Now you must sell breakfast all day. So those are, that's the power that you have as a franchisor over each one of your locations. So every time you sell a franchise, you get all of the benefits that I've talked about, but more importantly, you're getting a lot of funds up front, which allows you to spend those funds and develop better products and better services, which is going to feed right back into your business, and this whole circle continues. 
And again, with more buying power, if you're buying 10 pounds of tomatoes for your, for, for your pizza sauce on a weekly basis, when you have 10, 10 franchises, now you're buying 100 pounds of tomatoes at a time, meaning your prices are going to go down, meaning now you can actually do that $5 foot long as a sub shop that no other uh, location can, can, can compete with you. Um, every idea that a franchisee comes up with, and this is also very important, when a franchisees, these guys, are, they care about this business, that's why they invested the t tens of thousands of dollars to get into this business. Every single day that they're, they're, they're home, they're, they're going to sleep, they're thinking about the business like you are. So they come up with ideas. All of those ideas relating to your business belongs to you. So it comes right back to you. $5 foot long, I just mentioned that a second ago, is a great example of that. This is an example of a franchisee of Subway that was actually hurting. Their business wasn't doing very well. So he had this idea of, hey, may maybe I, I can lower my prices. I can offer a foot long sandwich for five bucks. He ran the idea by corporate, and the corporate noticed that this guy is hurting. What's the other alternative? He's going to shut down. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let him try it out. So he actually put the, put the, put, put the signage out there and said $5 foot long. The next day, he had a line out the door. And that's the whole idea of $5 foot long that's been running for so long now with Subway was born. So the franchisee came up with that idea, and it was owned by the franchisor. Tropical Smoothie Cafe is another very good example of that. So there was a local franchisee here in uh, South Florida where, you know, customers are not there, you began mixing things, and he started putting avocado in one of the shakes. South Florida, avocado is a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, product here. So he put avocado and coconut juice or whatever he did, and he came up with this whole tasting thing, and, 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 and he ran that by the CEO of, of the company, and, and he liked it. He tasted it, he liked it, he loved it, it became a menu item. So a lot of the menu items that you see on pro and restaurants and, 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 and um, places like this come from franchisees. So now, <clears throat> let's talk about why would someone buy your franchise? So let's assume you have an ice cream shop and you, know, you ask yourself, well if I franchise this business, why would somebody buy my franchise? Anybody knows how to start an ice cream shop. Why wouldn't I just start it on their own? Well, here's the answer. This study by the, Depart by the Chamber of Commerce tells you that they compared franchises that started and businesses that started on a given time. If you look at five years out, businesses that started on their own had only a 25% chance of survival. In other words, if you started a business today, you have a 50% chance that you go out of business next year, and you have a 75% chance that you go out of business within five years. If you bought a franchise, you have a 92% chance that you'll be in business five years from now. This is the reason why people would rather buy a franchise. Another important reason is that if I bought, if I'm gonna open an ice cream shop, I need a website, I need social media, I need business cards, I need brochures, I need marketing material. I have no clue. I know about ice cream, but I don't know about any of that stuff. Where do I start? How many mistakes am I going to make before I start becoming profitable? They rather pay you that twenty or thirty thousand dollar franchise fee and buy your model that's been proven. You have a website. You have five thousand people following you on your social media. You have all the marketing material. You've made all the mistakes already. So I rather buy into a business that's already been proven, and I rather have that partner that I can always call if I have a problem. So here's when I talk to business owners all the time. Um, this is what I hear all. I don't think I'm ready yet. I only have one location. Well, over 60% of franchises that you see in the market right now, from big to small, they all started with only one location. So people come to me and say, look, I'm about to open my fourth location. And I ask them, why? Why, do you, uh, why are you buying all of that liability for yourself? Why are you putting yourself through all of that work and, and tying up so much of your money and your time? Franchise the business and go that route. And again, a common one, oh, I'm not going to give my brand to anybody else. I, I, I've worked hard to build this brand. I'm not going to let some guy come in and destroy my brand, which is exactly the opposite. Because if you open your second or third location, that's precisely what you're doing. You're letting an employee of yours who doesn't have a vested interest in your business 
ruining your brand. Because what's the worst that can happen? You fire him. Big deal, he gets another job. So, but an owner operator or an owner of a franchise, he cares about this business, so he's, gonna dis he's not gonna destroy your brand. This is the reason why Subway with 44,000 locations, their brand is stronger than any other brand out there right now. Not one franchise out of those 44,000 locations has destroyed their brand. I'm still working on some few issues. I'm trying to perfect my business to get it ready for franchising. I hear this all the time. Well, listen, I used to work for Motorola for several years and I developed cell phones. I, I ran a big department there with, uh, with engineers that we developed cell phones and pager, paging devices back in the day. Some of you guys are younger than me. You probably don't even know what pages are. But um, so we always had this constant fight with the marketing department because the marketing department would say, well, wait a minute, we want to add this other feature before you ship it. Whoa, 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 one more feature we want to add to it, and one more feature, and one, this has to be perfect. Meanwhile, we're six months behind in shipping the product. Guys, we just lost millions of dollars, and our competitor has a product out there. We're still waiting to get our product out there. So as a business owner, you'll never be ready because we're all perfectionists. We want our business to be perfect. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. And I'm going to show you some examples. Get ready, start franchising. You grow with your franchise operation. You grow with this system, and you better your business, you better your franchise as time goes on. I want to remodel my business. I, my flooring isn't right. This flooring was an old flooring that I used because we didn't have the money to when, when, we started this when we started our business. I can't franchise this. Well, you can't. Does anybody in this room know, can recognize this restaurant? Anyone? Thank you very much. Subway. This is the very first Subway that started. It doesn't resemble anything like today's Subway, but guess what? He franchised the business. This is the business that got franchised, right there. Pete Subway, why? Because Dr. Peter Buck, um, well, the late Fred DeLuca, the founder of Subway, he just passed away a few, a couple months ago, a few months ago from cancer. Um, he was a true idol in franchising, and um, he went to, he didn't have the money, he wanted to pay for his medical school, so he went to Dr. Peter Buck, a good friend of his, and borrowed $1,000 to start a business. So with $1,000, they started this. That's why it's called Pete's Super Submarines. In 1968, they started franchising the business. Now, if I went to this guy, he would say, well, no, my business is not ready right now. I can't. How can I franchise that? Look at that thing. Well, guess what? In 1981, they made it a little bit nicer, and this is 2016, a completely different animal. So the business grows with the franchise. It gets better and better every day. So if you look at the number of franchises that they've sold, this is just some success stories. If you look at the number of franchises that Subway has sold, they started franchising, and by 1981, just six or seven years after they started franchising, they had 200 locations. Now, mind you, Sub Sandwich is a very generic franchise. We all know how to make sub sandwiches. There's nothing special about it. Most of you guys have very unique businesses. This is nothing unique. This is bread, mayonnaise, mustard, lettuce, tomato, whatever it is, and you got yourself a sandwich. I probably can make a better sandwich than any of those guys, right? But the bottom line is they grew. They grew very fast because, once again, people want to buy into a proven model as opposed to starting their own sub sandwich shop. In one year, they went from 200 to 300, so 50% increase in their franchise. By 1987, they had 1,000 locations. But guess what happened? In 1988, they doubled that. They sold 1,000 franchises. Today, they have 20, I'm sorry, 44,000 locations, and they grow by an average of about five franchise locations every single day. Every single day, five new franchises are open somewhere in this, uh, subways are open somewhere in this world. Look at Orange Fitness. This lady, which is from South Florida, had a Pilates studio that she was operating out of her house. She, could, she didn't have the money to start it. So she found a partner that gave her the money and she started a small gym right here in South Florida in 2010. And she immediately franchised it. Very smart lady. She's extremely an uh, brilliant uh, lady. She started franchising this business in 2010. Today they have 20, uh, 308 locations. That's an average, an average of one new location per week. She's growing. 
Okay, and remember in franchise sales, if I may be, go back to this, you always see an exponential growth. You're gonna start off slowly, and then you're gonna grow, grow, grow faster and faster and faster. So, franchisees also allow you to think outside the box, okay? As your business is growing, you start thinking about how I can make my franchise better. If you look at B British Swim School, is a very good example of that. So this is another lady that started this business and she franchised it. Soon after she franchised it, she realized that the business of, uh, it's, it's about basically a, a, a swimming uh, education for kids, for children. She realized that one of the problems of her business was that she needed to have a pool. So if you were to buy a franchise, you had to have a pool, which is expensive. So she said, okay, what do I do in order to grow faster? Because it's very hard to find people that have a pool or have the money or the, the space and all of that. So she said, let me think. So she puts her thinking hat on and with the help of some of her franchisees inputting and giving her ideas, she says, why don't I utilize the pools that are already in place? Hotels have pools, gyms have pools, and half the time the gyms are empty. The pools in the gyms are empty. Everybody's working out, the treadmills are taken, but the pools are empty. So if you go to LA Fitness right now, there's a partnership between her and LA Fitness, and you can see her banner standing up in front of the door so that you can actually take your child there and utilize their pool and teach your kids how to swim. So that's a very innovative franchise, and those are the things that come to you as franchises. This is not a franchise, but I love this example and I wanted to kind of bring it up. So if you guys recall, soy milk used to be a product that you, they still have it, but not much on the shelves of supermarkets. But guess what? It wasn't really selling much. Some brilliant guy came in and says, why don't we package this up like milk and put it in the fridge section? Soy milk doesn't have to be refrigerated. So they put it in the fridge section, and guess what? Their sales went up by three folds overnight. And it stayed there ever since. So innovative outs outside the box thinking is what has made Subway who it is right now. Subway, for example, had some issues with Quiznos. They were toasting the bread. Subway wasn't toasting the bread. So Subway saw, for the first time, some competition from Quiznos. So what did they do? They went out, looked for a solution. They've got those big ovens now that cost five grand. They look for a way to actually have it provided to each franchisee for free so they don't have to pay five grand for it. They found a sponsor. And those ovens that you see, the semi-oven, semi-microwave semi that you see in every subway toasts the bread and therefore they put Quiznos out of business. They're almost gone. I mean, Quiznos is crushed. So those out-of-the-box thinking is what makes a, a franchise into a good franchise. All right. So let's talk about the mean potato of this workshop, which is how do I franchise my business? All right, you've got me sold. I should franchise my business, but how do I do this? So the very first thing that you want to think about if you're considering franchising your business is, is my business franchisable? Now, Almost all businesses are franchisable. There are hardly any business that is not, but there are some. There are some. There are few businesses that are not franchisable. <coughs> Excuse me. So you want to find out if, you, if your business can be duplicated. Can, it, can your business be made in a second location, third location? If you already have a second location, then the answer is already made. The second thing you want to know is, is your business teachable? Can you actually provide a training to someone and teach someone to run your business? And almost all the time, the, the answer is yes. Unless you are some type of an athlete that is the reason why people are coming to you to learn your methods and, you know, and if your name wasn't there, they wouldn't come to this gym, then yeah, that's, that's a problem. But otherwise, Pretty much anything else is teachable. Location specific. In other words, are you selling a product? Are you selling a service that only is good on a given location? I was going to, you know, back in the day when I did these, uh, these, these uh, workshops, I would use 
Cuban coffee as an example. I would use anything that's ethnic here in Miami as an example. That was even a bad example. That has now become a nationwide phenomenon, right? Anybody, anybody in no matter where they are, they know what Cuban coffee is. But if you have a product that is only good for particular ethnicity or particular group of people and it's not going to work somewhere else, yeah, I would probably think twice about franchising it. If your business is special talent hungry, meaning that you have to have a particular talent to work in your business for it to work. So in other words, hiring people is almost impossible because you have imported your employees from who knows what country and what university or whatever the case is, and you can't find those readily available everywhere. So yeah, that's a tough one. You, is your business you? If your business is you, you can't franchise this business. If everything around this business runs around you, and if I removed you because you haven't taken a vacation in seven years because if you went on vacation, they have to shut down, that business isn't franchisable. And I advise you to look for another business because that's a bad business. Is your business affordable? Is it going to cost $5 million to start this business? And is it going to take 10 years for me to recoup that investment? So. The entry level, the amount of money that it takes to get to a business is extremely important. So if you have a business that you can get started for $100,000 or $150,000, that's very desirable. $200,000, $250,000, $300,000, very desirable. Subway sells for around $200,000, a little bit less. Uh, McDonald's is in the millions, 1.8 or whatever million it is to get started. So as the price goes up, it has an inverse relationship with the amount of franchises you sell. The lower the, the, the lower the startup fee, the more franchises you sell. The higher the startup fee, the less franchises you sell. Now, aside from that, another aspect of affordable is how quickly can you get this money back? Okay? So if I were to spend $150,000 and get this business started, is it going to take me one, two, three, five, ten years to get this money back? How long does it take? If in the franchise world, if you can recoup your investment in three years or less, you have a good franchise. In two years or less, you have a great franchise. In one year or less, where do I sign? It's an amazing franchise, right? So if you guys have a business that is that you can start for let's I'm just gonna say two hundred thousand dollars but the business produces two twenty five two thirty a year of profit I don't know what you're waiting for <coughs> excuse me well managed is the business well managed what does that mean that means you the owners of the company are you people if I were to buy a franchise from you that means you and I are gonna get married for ten years I'm gonna be in with you as a partner for the next 10 years. I have to like you, you have to like me. If I'm not a likable guy, I can't sell a franchise, okay? At the end of the day, every person that wants to buy one of these franchises, they're gonna come to you and they're gonna interview you. You're gonna interview them. You're not gonna just sell a franchise to anybody that comes in. You're not gonna have them representing your brand just because they got a checkbook. Same way with them, they have options. There are thousands of franchises out there they can choose from. So you have to be a likable per you have to have a likable personality as well. So what do I what do I need in order to get um, a franchise started? What exactly how do I franchise my business? What exactly is a franchise? So number 1, you have to have a trademark for your brand. Those of you that have a good business and you care about the growth of your business like I did when I had my Gardekit business, the very first thing you have to do is trademark it. If you haven't done it, as soon as you leave here today, guys, the show finishes, I think, at 5 o'clock. 5.30, you better be uh, trademarking your franchise. You have no, you're trademarking your brand. You have no idea the stories that I hear all day, every day, with people that have a great name. They go off, and they were one day or two days late, and somebody trademarked a brand like it. As your business grows, we, we're on the World Wide Web, guys. You, you can just log in. Wow, what a cool name. I'm going to trademark it. They'll lock you in. So now you can't grow your business because you've got to buy that trademark back from them for tens of thousands of dollars. Trademark your brand. It doesn't cost very much. You can get a trademark done for probably $1,000 to $2,000. It's a very good idea to do that. 
The second thing you need, remember guys, franchises are regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. It's a regulated industry. On top of the Fe uh, Federal Trade Commission, there are also several states that have their own regulations. You have to have a document called the Franchise Disclosure Document. It's a pretty thick document. This is a legal document that is developed for each specific franchise. So if you have a, a business that, whatever it is that you do, this document is developed, and it takes a long time to develop it, to disclose to a particular individual the details of your business. Everything from your background, everything from um, uh, the, the financials of the company, everything from when did you start, how did you start, all of that information is inside this franchise disclosure document. And it's there to allow a particular individual who's interested in buying into your business to be able to look into you and say, yeah, this is a guy or a company that I want to partner with, or no, this is not who I want to partner with. This guy has bad background or has whatever it is in his background, and I don't want to be a part of it. That's why the information is there. There are 23 items in the franchise disclosure document. Each item relates to a particular part of your background or your business's background. Um, it even involves information about bankruptcy, litigations, things like that that you may have had in your background. Now, that doesn't mean if you have bankruptcy in your background, you should never franchise your business. Absolutely not. We lived through the bad years of 2008, 2009, 50% of Americans pretty much have a bankruptcy in their background now, so that's a thing of a past. But it still has to be there. So the franchise disclosure document also has something about the, it's called an item 19. It's basically information about your current operation. So people come to me and say, look, my, 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 shop, my business is doing X amount of dollars in sales. Do I have to disclose that when I franchise my business? And the answer is no. It's up to you. If you want to disclose what your business is making right now or not, it's entirely up to you. If you're making great money and your, 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 your net profit is fantastic, I would encourage you to disclose it. But majority of franchises out there, 65 to 70 percent, it used to be as high as 90 percent back 10 years ago, do not disclose their financials. So you're getting into a business without knowing how well or how bad each one of the locations are doing. So if your business, whatever your numbers are, if you don't want to disclose them, you have the opportunity not to. So if you don't disclose them, the drawback is that if someone asks, tell me about your business, how well it's doing, you can't answer that question because you've chosen not to disclose it. If you do, then it opens that up for a better discussion and dialogue with your, with your prospect. The next item that you must have is a franchise agreement, which happens to be an exhibit of the franchise disclosure document. The franchise agreement is really the product, the, the document that gets signed between the franchisor and the franchisee. So it has all the rules and regulations, whatever requirements you have in there. And then finally, the operations manual. Operations manual is the document that basically produces information about what to do when you wake up in the morning and open the, your store or turn the key on to a car if you have a mobile operation. How do I, what do I do? Where do I go? How do I get my uh, sales? All of that information is inside the operations manual. When do I open the store? When do I close the store? Uh, how do I do the cleaning at the end of the day? What do I do with the cash money? How do I deposit my checks? When do I order inventory? All of that stuff is in a product called an operations manual. <coughs> the operations manual is a living document, meaning that it starts off very, young, very sh short and it grows as years go by. If you look at the operations manual of an emerging franchise, like if you were to franchise your business, it would probably be anywhere between 50 to 60 to 70 pages. If you look at the operations manual of Subway or McDonald's, it's thousands of pages long. Books after books after books. So on top of these uh, the requirements, certain states require you to register your franchise before you can sell those franchises. In the, uh, before you can actually sell franchises or offer franchises in their states. So those states are states that you probably won't start selling in right off the bat. Those are mostly 
It's California, New York, Illinois, Maryland, Virginia, Hawaii, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Rhode Island. It's like 13 states that don't, they want you to register separately with them, which you can if you want. My recommendation would be to start selling franchises from very, very near your low operation. If you have an operation in Orlando, you want to start selling franchises in Orlando and then go out uh, from there. You don't want to have a franchise in, an operation in Orlando and sell a franchise in Hawaii and then sell another one in New York and then sell another one uh, down in the Keys. You don't want to do that. You want to grow from your center out so that you have a good grasp of the operation and be able to support them if you need to. Okay. So then when you get leads from those states is little by little is when you're going to go and register in those states. No, no, it is one document. There's not two documents, it's one document. You supply that to those 13 registration states and the, the, the states would review the document, come back with some remarks, changes that they want you to make to make it friendly to their state. And this is this one document you use. Now, everything that I just mentioned to you here, all of the stuff that makes you be a franchise, you know, makes you meet the requirements of the Federal Trade Commission, who can produce that for you? And the answer to that question is, there are two resources. And please don't tell me I'm going to do it on my own because <laughs> just don't. <laughs> just don't. Trust me. You get yourself in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble, because this is a very serious business, right? You're trying to build an empire, guys. You're trying to build an empire. And if the foundation of this huge building is messed up, it's going to crumble someday. So put a tremendous uh, foundation so that this building can go as high as you want it to go. Hire a professional. A franchise attorney can certainly provide you with the legal documents. Okay? And that's all they can do for you is the legal documents. The problem with a franchise attorney is they're, they're intelligent in what they do, but all they do is legal documents, meaning they've never owned a business before, they've never ran a franchise before, they've never had to deal with hundreds of franchises which always have support issues and questions and what have you. So an attorney is not going to be there with you as a partner through this whole journey. This is the reason why I always suggest to go with a consultant, with a professional consultant, not a guy that comes to you and says, yeah, 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 I, I had a couple of franchises, let me help you out. That's not the guy you want. You want a guy with, repu with a reputation out there. Or a girl or a guy, I just, I'm, uh, uh, whatever it's, uh, it is that that person is doing, you want to make sure that that person has a real world experience. One thing is, look, man, I read a couple of books on franchising. I know all about it. Let me help you out. I also know a great attorney that can do the legal documents for you. But the reality is that you want to work with someone that has done it, has lived through it, and has answered questions as problems have uh, come up in the past. So the best practices for franchising your business, the first thing that I would suggest to you to do or have someone do for you if you don't know how to do it is to do a full market research, a, a, a full market study, okay? Understand, you understand your competition today, but in franchising, your competition today isn't important. The competition in the world of franchising is what is important. So we want to make sure that you understand who's going to be competing with you when you become a franchise. So if I'm interested in buying a emerging uh, pizza franchise, I'm probably looking at other pizza franchises like Domino's. I'm looking at all the other ones. So you want to understand who they are, what their offering is, what is it that they charge for franchise fee, what royalty they charge, what is it that they charge for renewal fee, how long is the contract, all of those informations, all of those pieces of information are selling points for someone that's interested in investing in your franchise. You want to make sure that you're very competitive with everybody else that's out there. So we typically choose, we do a competitive study. What I suggest is that you do a competitive study. You look at the royalty fees of all your competitors and you make your royalty fee just a tad bit smaller. You look at the franchise, the initial franchise fee, the one that I just mentioned, twenty dollars to $50,000. If, if your competitors are charging $30,000, 35000 $27,000, you charge twenty-five. dollars You charge twenty. dollars 
you're an emerging franchise. So you start off with a low franchise fee, enter into the market, and then as your business grows, you're going to raise the franchise fee. So maybe the first four or five franchises you sell are buying at a lower price, and then as this business grows, and now you have references for people to talk to, you can actually increase the franchise fee. Okay, so you then want to lay out a financial plan. You want to understand what it is that how much money you're gonna spend. So you're gonna spend money in franchising your business. You're gonna have to pay this attorney, you're gonna have to pay this consultant, whatever you got, hopefully a consultant, you're gonna pay him and he's going to, he or she is gonna charge you money. So you have to have a financial plan for that. The next thing is, okay, now that you are a franchise, you wanna market this franchise, you wanna let the world know this franchise exists. You're an, you're an emerging brand. So you gotta let the world become aware of this brand and you want to be, make sure that you have some money set aside for that marketing. It's not very high, it's, it's hundreds, maybe a, few, a couple thousand dollars a month. It's not very high. And it's the most rewarding money you ever spend in advertising your franchise. Because think about it, <clears throat> you spend one month couple thousand dollars, the next month a thousand dollars, between the two months you've spent two or three thousand dollars in marketing and guess what, you've sold one franchise already. You collected twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars of franchise fee, that's the best two or three thousand dollars you've ever spent. So it's a very rewarding advertising. It isn't like advertising, again I go back to the pizza shop, if you have a pizza shop and you put an advertisement out there, you advertise in a magazine and it costs you two or three thousand dollars, you say to yourself, how many pizzas am I going to sell to recover that two or three thousand dollars? All you got to do is sell one franchise and you got the, you've covered the entire marketing dollars for the entire year, right? So it's a very rewarding uh, marketing, if you will. You want to set realistic goals. Sometimes people come to me and say, look, is it possible for me to sell 200 franchises this year? And I'm like, uh, I don't know how much money you got. Right? I mean, if, if you got millions of dollars in marketing, yeah, we can do whatever you want. We can sell a thousand. But the realistically is you don't want to sell 200 franchises this year. You want to sell 10. You want to sell 12. You want to sell eight. You want to sell nine, depending on what business you're in. Why? Because you want to be able to make sure that you have the support to handle it. Okay? The support is extremely important. Sometimes people ask me also, they say, how many people should I hire before I start franchising my business because I have to have the support and staffing. And my answer to them is zero, zero. When I franchised my business of Gardekid, which again grew to all of these locations, close to 200 locations in 11 countries, I started with myself and my wife. That's how the business started. We sold, the f we sold one franchise in the first month, two franchises in the second month, and I believe four franchises in the third month, and the rest is history. As these franchises were being sold, we were setting ourselves off to, off to support them. So we were supporting them ourselves. And of course, it got to a point where I said, okay, well, I can't provide this support, but guess what? I've got tens of thousands of dollars in the bank now from all these franchise fees that I've collected, so I hired someone to handle the support. So as this grows, you, hand, you hire people to support you. Don't go out and spend the money. I'm, I, for one, say when, you, when you're about to franchise your business, hold on to all your money as much as possible because you don't need to spend the money. As the money comes in, you take the business money and you spend it back on itself. Hire an expert franchise consultant. You want to have a relationship with this consultant. Do not hire a consultant that just shakes your hand and says, here's your documents, have a nice day. That's not a good consultant. Why? Because you want to be able to have a partner with you as this business grows. When you have 120 franchises and the 121st is a call that you get from Panama and the guy says I'm interested in buying a franchise you want someone to answer the question can I sell this franchise in Panama what do I need to do so you need someone to be there to answer that question for you because time is of the essence that guy is gonna go away and buy something else so you need someone to be alongside with you coming along for the ride and be able to answer your questions uh, for you what can you expect from this franchise consultant you can ex expect you can expect them to do the whole list that I have in here. Very, very important. This list is extremely important. So you want them to do initially a franchisability study. Okay, they, you, your business has to be franchisable. Otherwise, you're wasting your money, they're wasting their time. You want them to do a competitive study, like I mentioned, and determine who your competitors are. 
An on-site evaluation is very important. Someone needs to go to your store, to your business, to your restaurant. If you have a mobile business, someone needs to step into that van and tell you, okay, you got to make this change and that change and this change and that change for it to be smooth. Someone needs to produce for you your staffing needs, okay? Just like I said, you're okay right now, Johnny. You, you got a great plan, but as you sell the second franchise, I want you to hire one person to handle the support, on and on and on. So staffing needs are going to be very important. Someone needs to determine what the initial franchise fee is. If someone meets with you on the first meeting, they tell you, your franchise fee should be $25,000, walk away from that meeting. Because you can't take these numbers out of the air. It has to be done with... With, the, with respect to a study that's, that's done. So franchise fee, royalty amount, the advertising amount, the, the, the length of the, the contract, it should be a five-year agreement, a 10-year agreement. Uh, all of that should be things that come out of a competitive study. And the territory size. Each time you, 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 you award a franchise to someone and they open a location, they are protected, they should be protected meaning that you promise not to open another location across the street from them so that they know that their investment is protected, that as you grow, you're not going to open one. There are certain franchises, some of the bigger names out there don't have territories anymore because you know why they can do it? Because they can, right? There's still people are still buying these franchises, but the bottom line is with an emerging franchise like yours, you have to have an exclusive territory. You got to tell the guy, I'm not going to open another location like this within three miles radius of your store or five mile radius of your store. Radius is also important when we talk about territory. You want to combine mileage and population because a three mile radius in the city of Manhattan may be a population of five million people or two million people or three million people. A three mile radius in Wyoming may be 200 people. So you want, <laughs> more than that. So you want to make sure that you do, are you from a Wyoming? Okay, wonderful. So uh, you want to make sure that um, you combine it. So you, you, you say the lesser of, for example, three miles or 400,000 people or 300,000 people. You want to develop a support program, an organization for your franchise as it grows. Uh, of course, we talked about all the legal documents that that consultant has to work with an attorney to produce. Consultants cannot produce legal documents but they work with legal uh, uh, entities that of course become your legal entities and they produce those uh, documents with advice from the consultant because that's very important. And then of course your marketing program. Multi-unit agreement, I want to touch on that real quick, quick guys, and I know we're running out of time because I want to leave some room for, for, for discussions here. Multi-unit agreement is one that someone comes to you and says, listen, I'm a big, I'm a big investor and I'm not in here to, to, to buy one single location. I want the rights to all of Boston. I want the rights to all of New York City. So you come around and say, okay, we can talk about that. For those rights, you're gonna, you, you, he's gonna give you a huge sum of money up front for you to reserve that area for him, not to award another franchise in that area until he's ready to open each one of these locations. And you're gonna give him some time for him to open it. You're gonna give him two years or three years for him to open those locations and for that, he's going to give you a large sum of money. And as he opens these areas, he's going to pay you the rest of the money that he owes on each one of these locations. So typically, they pay you 50% of the franchise fee for all these locations that he's going to open up front, and then he pays you the other 50% when he opens them. So that's another thing that you need to have because it's very popular in franchising right now. Of course, all the accounting needs, trainings, the point of sale evaluation. Somebody needs to say, okay, this point of sale that you're using right now is good or is bad or, or whatever the case is so that you, have, you can monitor all the point of sales uh, throughout uh, your network. And also, of course, at the end, you want the same entity to be able to sell your franchises for you because that's how they have a vested interest in your business. If I were to just franchise your business and walk away, I have no interest in producing documents that are sellable. But if I knew that I'm going to be selling these franchises for you, I have all the means to make sure that I do this right so that this business is sellable because that is the money that we're going to make is on the back end. So you want the same entity that franchises your business to also sell your franchises for you or at least help you with the marketing and sales. I'm just going to give you a quick s couple of slides about us and I'm going to open this up to discussions, questions, anything you may have. We're a Miami-based company. Um, 
you know, we are a consultant. Uh, we are franchise consultants ourselves. Um, we have franchised a number of businesses throughout the country. Uh, a lot of them here in South Florida, but we have done businesses. We have done a lot of franchises throughout uh, the nation, West Coast, East Coast, everywhere. Um, as I mentioned to you, we have the, the experience from running our own franchise operation. Uh, I have, you know, successfully being ranked uh, among the top 500 franchises m pretty much every year of its operation. <clears throat> uh, the good thing about what we do is to see businesses like yourselves that come to us with one, two, three locations and then see them grow into a multi-million dollar business. We have franchise businesses uh, 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 that came to us with two locations and within two years they have 60 locations throughout the world. And that's the pleasure in what we do when we see businesses like that. One thing, guys, I want you to remember is one of the beautiful things about franchising is the valuation of your business. It's huge. Valuation of your business goes through the roof when you franchise your business. So if you sell five, six, ten franchises, whatever your business was worth, you can have a huge multiplier buy on that when you go to sell it. At the end of the day, it's all about your exit strategy. Okay? Like, like I said, with, with my business after five years, and you're going to get that all the time guaranteed, that you're going to get people that are going to knock on your doors and they want to buy this business from you and that is your exit strategy. So this is why we call franchising a bridge to wealth. This, you, you, all of you guys in this room are busy running your operation trying to make whatever, the ends meet. Make another 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 not realizing that if, you, if, if this was a franchise operation, you're looking at millions. You're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars, not one or two or three or $4,000. That's where the real wealth is. Now, this is a chart that basically what we do, we, we, we are a turnkey operation. Again, this, we're just an example of a consulting firm. There are, you know, the, the good thing about us is there's, is there's a few of us in this country. This is a very niche business. But we happen to have a turnkey operation. We provide the entire gamut, A through Z, so that you as business owners can concentrate on your own business and you don't have to get worried about how the franchise is being developed. We do everything for you from A through Z and we sell the franchise for you. So we have our phase A operation and that is to turn your business into a franchise operation, a successful franchise and phase B would be to sell these franchises and market them and sell them and get you to become that large entity and achieve that American dream that you wanted to achieve. Lawyers, only all they can do is the legal documents and there are certain consultants that do one piece or two piece or three pieces and they tell you this is what we do go ahead and hire others that do the rest of it and you can do that if you wanted to the timeline for the process usually takes about 60 to 90 days it varies from company to company right so we have done a lot of healthcare franchises we have done a lot of one uh, first time franchises we're the company that basically introduced electronic cigarettes into the franchise world. Um, and now you have seen them all around the country. Uh, we introduced the very first plastic surgery franchise into the world. We have introduced the very first um, uh, orthopedic urgent care into the franchise world, as well as a, um, uh, other medical uh, franchises that we have put out there. Uh, we have done a lot of different first-time uh, franchises, and we're very, very, very proud of that. Uh, but again, the process takes that long. Cost versus, versus benefit, guys. Um, remember one thing, and I want to uh, I want to emphasize this really quickly. Sometimes when you think about, okay, it's going to cost me X amount of dollars. It's going to cost a lot of money to franchise my business. I'm going to give you this. If I told you an investment that you can make today that is almost guaranteed that you recoup that investment within one month, two months, or three months, and it increases the valuation of your business by two, three, four fo folds, why would you say no to that? Why in the world, if you know that if I sell one single franchise, one single franchise, I have recovered my money that I spent in franchising my business, well, you're going to sell a franchise within first month, second month, the latest third month. I mean, it's not going to take years to sell a franchise. So you recoup that investment within the first franchise that you sell. So there is no reason. You guys have spent tens of thousands of dollars opening your operation, whatever business you're doing, and it sometimes takes one, two, three years to recoup that investment. This investment, which is going to increase the valuation of your business, all it takes is sales of one single franchise, sometimes two, depending on what your franchise fee is. So it's honestly a no-brainer. Um, this is a parallel path for expanding your business. 
Meaning that sometimes people say, well, you know what? I'm doing well the way I'm doing it. Yes, you are, but this is not going to replace what you're doing. This is that highway. You're, you're taking the street to work. Franchising is going to provide you that highway. If you want to take the highway, go right ahead, but the street is still there. So you can continue to, if you want, if you like to grow yourself, grow your own business on your own, you can have second, third, fourth, fifth locations. But if you want to just basically get into the world of franchising and do nothing but franchising, it's there for you. So it's a parallel path. And again, this is your bridge to wealth. So w just quickly go through these. You have to think to yourself, should I, so should I franchise my business? Well, why did you start this business to begin with? What is your goal? Do you have a near-term and long-term goal? Does your business get your heart pumping? Do you have the passion for your business? I did. When I franchised my business, I was very passionate about it. Once again, I had two young kids that could utilize that product that I was putting out there. Um, are you working in your business or on your business? Majority of you guys that, have, that are business owners, every day you go to work and you're working in your business, meaning that you don't have time to breathe. All you do is you're just trying to do, get things done and go home, not realizing that you need to, to step out and think outside the box. Think about the soy milk example that I gave you. You need, to th you, need, you need to think that way. You need to have the time. And by franchising, it allows you to have the time to, think, to, b to work on your business. If you have one or two locations, is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? Because I can assure you, growing on your own, unless you have the money that, 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 that Starbucks had, millions of dollars, you cannot grow this on your own and become a nationwide or a global company. If you want to do something extraordinary, you must, if you want something extraordinary, you've got to do something extraordinary to achieve that, right? So here's something extraordinary. There are 29 million businesses in the U.S., but guess what? Only 3,000 franchises. So if you're going to be among the 3,000, you have done something extraordinary. So you can expect extraordinary results. If you're going to open another business and become 29 million and one, you haven't done anything extraordinary. These are some of the companies that um, we have franchised here in the local market.